Okay. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, so dear colleagues, and a special welcome to our friends at uh, GSE Norden in Kristiansand. That's uh, Harald, uh, Egil Norman, and Jan Hage. And of course, a uh, uh, very warm welcome to Mr. Anthony Upworth. And as I said, uh, that's a man with a number of hats that you probably will get back to. Yes, I will. Yeah, cool. Uh, but first, I would say just some, some, some words. Um, uh, and as you know, in our corporate strategy, we say that we shall incorporate sustainability in everything we do. Uh, that, that's quite a bold statement, but it's a necessary goal given the times that we live in. And we will try to fulfill this goal in our everyday work. But to be able to deliver sustainable value to our many customers, we need proper knowledge and, and suitable tools. Now, in our search for practical and powerful tools that uh, can help us in realizing our strategy, we came across, or more correct, Anthony came across us in our efforts. This as a result of his work with uh, Gese Noda uh, in Kristiansand in our Toronto office. Uh, okay, that was the very super short um, about, about the background for the for the webinar. So now let's dive into the today's uh, subject, which is from sustainability to flourishing businesses. Uh, and we're going to have a look on practical tools and methods to imagine enterprises fit for the future. So in this 90-minute webinar, you will be able to uh, you will be introduced to a new Fit for the Future collaborative visual business modeling tool. That's the Flourishing Business Canvas. Um, and as I said, your presenter will be Anthony Upward, one of the leading, uh, one of the leaders in the project bringing uh, this enhanced tool to the world. So Anthony, he will provide us an overview uh, of the uh, power of leaders of business modeling and business modeling tools. He will give you an initial experience of the flourishing business canvas uh, and uh, work through uh, a case study of the business model of a certified B corporation. Uh, he will also mention how business modeling can be used to help develop uh, better fit for the future strategies for established businesses and startups. And at the end, he would also like uh, to respond on your questions. So with this, I would have the honor to give the word, word to Mr. Anthony Upward, please. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, and uh, first of all, let me say thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you all. It's uh, very exciting to, uh, uh, to be talking to all of you across uh, Norway. I, I'm recognizing some of the place names already, but uh, some of them are new for me. So uh, I'm, I'm getting to know uh, Norway a, a little better as time, time goes on. Um, as uh, you may also know, uh, this webinar is a lead up to a uh, one day workshop that we'll be running in Oslo on October the 27th and 28th. Uh, so we start at lunchtime on the 27th and we finish at lunchtime on the 28th. And I, I believe you'll you have all been invited to uh, to join that so this is an introduction for for that webinar um and uh yeah so uh, let's get started um so from sustainability to uh, to flourishing uh, business let's uh, uh start to think about this so uh one thing that we uh, like to start with try and get my slides working here uh, so let me introduce myself first as um uh, as, uh klaus mentioned uh, I have a, a number of different hats, and that starts with uh, the title that I tend to give myself, uh, which is a pracademic. So this is a, a practicing academic, uh, and so I'm going to unpack both the practice side of what I do and the academic side of what I do, uh, just to give you a sense of, of uh, who I am and what I've been up to. So uh, if I wanted to label myself, I'd call myself a sustainability business architect. So that's somebody who designs businesses uh, with a view to sustainability as flourishing as the outcome. So financial, social, and environmental. Uh, I have a consulting company called Edward James Consultant. We are flourishing enterprise designers. Uh, my company is a certified benefit corporation for the last uh, two years. And collectively, uh, I have about 30 years of experience designing, planning, and managing IT-enabled change programs, and obviously increasingly sustainability-enabled change as well. I'm uh, on the academic side now. I, I'm an uh, adjunct professor. Uh, at the Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto. 
uh, in the faculties of design and graduate studies and I'm also an industry partner with their strategic innovation lab. Now you might be wondering why is somebody involved in business modeling and business design at an art and design university and so the uh, interesting thing about OCAD is that uh, in the faculty of design more than half of their faculty are focused on using all the techniques of design uh, to design anything that is not a thing. So obviously design can be about tables, chairs, landscapes, um, but at OCAD more than half the faculty are focused on uh, designing, using all the techniques of design to design policy, procedure, conversations, and of course business models. So these are uh, again uh, the reason why I'm, I'm at OCAD is that there's a lot of people doing similar work uh, there and in fact many people at OCAD were involved in helping to design uh, the business model canvas and the number of the names in the front of the book business model generation are uh, other professors at OCAD. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor at Halmstad University on the west coast of Sweden so um, fairly close to where all of you are uh, and that's in their department of innovation management and specifically in their center for innovation entrepreneurship and learning uh, so I've been an adjunct professor there for about a, a year now uh, and uh, co-published quite a few articles and some more on the way with them. I'm also uh, the originator of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Ontology. Um, many of you probably know that the Business Model Canvas was based on Oscar Holder's uh, PhD, uh, where he created the Business Model Ontology. So in my graduate research, uh, I built on his PhD and asked the question, so what is it that uh, we need to think about if we're trying to describe the social, environmental, and financial aspects of a business model? Uh, that's been published in a peer review article that's increasingly well uh, cited um, and uh, ha happy to share all of those details if you're interested. Um, obviously, the, a technical artifact like the ontology isn't very useful to practitioners. Uh, so with my practitioner hat on my head, uh, we are now working to bring that to the world in a toolkit, uh, which we're calling the Flourishing Enterprise Innovation Toolkit. And that includes the canvas, but also methods and other things which I'll introduce later on. Um, I've also uh, recently helped to co-found the Flourishing Enterprise Institute, um, and this is uh, going to be a planetary-wide network of nodes that is doing research that respects the idea that business has to uh, be in a place, in a locality, and respect the culture and uh, other biophysical uh, limitations of that place, uh, but is also on a single planet, so we have to be recognizing that as well. And the Flourishing Enterprise Institute is emerging from a uh, community of research and practice which was founded, uh, which I helped to co-found in 2012, called the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. And that group now has over 1,600 uh, people in it. We have a monthly meeting. We just had our 85th meeting. Um, and uh, I can, again, share more about that if that's interesting. Last but not least, also on the practice side, I'm the co-founder of a number of organizations. Uh, the first is the Cooperative of Flourishing Enterprise Innovators. Uh, this is in a very early stage. This will be the legal entity uh, that is going to be bringing the toolkit to the world as a cooperative of all the people using uh, and the toolkit in the world. Um, next, uh, I'm the co-founder of a small uh, for-profit uh, company focused on designing uh, and developing and delivering programming for entrepreneurs. Uh, this is called Lean for Flourishing Startups, uh, again, having enhanced the Lean Startup method, and I'll talk more about that later. And last but not least, uh, also a, a separate uh, for-profit uh, company focused on consulting with existing businesses, uh, so helping them with strategy. And it's actually Better My Business that has been doing the work with uh, GC Noda. Okay, so that's a little bit about me and the hats that I wear. Um, the next thing I'd like to do is, uh, before getting into the detail of this, um, is to try and sort of set a context um, from both a social perspective and also a place perspective. Um, this idea originated from the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission uh, in Canada, uh, which was exploring um, what have we got to do to uh, understand the real nature of what's happened between Canada and its uh, First Nations, uh, the peoples who were there before the colonizers arrived. And so uh, the next two slides have been inspired by uh, a recommendation that came out of that, which is really to make sure that we acknowledge uh, our privilege socially uh, and uh, in environmentally as well. Uh, before I do that, I can hear some breathing, so I'm just going to mute, make sure everybody's muted. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's, let's do this. So, uh, what I just want to acknowledge is that this is, wherever we are today, and, and I'm not in Norway today, so we're, we're in different places, 
that this is sacred land on which, on which each of us are privileged to be. Uh, the land, the nearby lakes and the sea has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. And we are privileged to be the beneficiaries and stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations that are, come to, that are to come and indeed beyond this. And we invite you, I invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect the people indigenous to your place, including of course, all of you yourselves. And today, each of us in each place around the world is increasingly a home to people from across the world. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. So if you start to think about sustainable business, this type of thinking, this type of appreciation of people and the place uh, that those people are in is actually a critical component to designing a business that is going to uh, be sustainable and enable the possibility for flourishing. So this is on the people side. Um, also want to just talk about uh, the place uh, that we're all in. So I, I'd like to ask you all a question. Do you know what watershed you're in today? What's the nearest large river to where you are? Uh, if you want to uh, respond in the chat, I'd be delighted to uh, see uh, if you know where you are. Would people like to put some messages, things in the chat? Again, the idea here is that if we're going to design businesses that are sustainable, we as business people have to recognize where it is that we are in. Excellent. Lots of, lots of local knowledge, that's, that's excellent. In, in some audiences, uh, I get completely blank looks and uh, no, nobody knows, nobody's given it the slightest thought. So uh, that's excellent that, that uh, many of you know that, uh, where you are uh, biophysically. So let me just tell you where I am, just so you know. Uh, I'm in London uh, in the UK today, uh, and this is uh, not quite the view out of my hotel room, but if I uh, had a room facing the other way, I could actually see uh, this river, the River Lee, uh, which uh, has, uh, because it's in London, and London's a very old place, uh, there was actually a Roman ford uh, at this point in the river, uh, actually just a little bit in the distance there. Uh, and um, so that's over about 2,000 years old, uh, that the humans in and around this river at least. Um, it's actually at the junction of the Hartford Canal that I'm sitting in today. And the upper reaches of this river are still today a major source of uh, drinking water uh, for, um, uh, uh, for London. Sorry, and I can just hear some rustling in the background. I'm just trying to find, make sure people are all muted. Um, so the, the lower section of the river is now entirely canalized. It's all been uh, changed by man and it's now actually called uh, the Lee Navigation. And that work uh, to uh, alter the river by humans started in 1425, so quite a long time ago. And the last major works were done in 1911. Now, when you do that sort of work, it means that you're building structures on the river to help the river better serve humanity. Um, but that means, of course, there's an ongoing cost to that, both in terms of money and time and, and materials. And so there's actually over a hundred structures, locks, weirs and channels that all now have to be maintained by humanity in order to uh, sustain the value of the, 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 all the different uses that we now have for the river. And just to bring this right down to, uh, to, uh, to us now, uh, if uh, in whatever place you're in, the watershed provides you with vital services. And so in the minutes around this webinar, if you visited the bathroom, you actually did take advantage of your local watershed because it was the biophysical, the, those biophysical stocks and the ecosystem services uh, that constitute the watershed actually help take away your, your wastes. Um, and in terms of the Flourishing Business Canvas, one of the things that we've added to the Flourishing Business Canvas is biophysical stocks and solar powered ecosystem services. And again, this is to allow us to fully understand how our businesses are interacting and dependent upon uh, the natural environment where the business is placed. So just to kind of set the scene, this is the type of consideration that we want to be bringing into uh, our business designing. So let's uh, also look at this from a business model perspective. So how do we, in the work that we've been doing over the last uh, nearly 10 years now, uh, understand uh, business models? Well, the first thing is, that, is to think about um, what's a useful way to, or what's the most useful way for business to think about how they are related to everything else that's in the world. And so what we believe is that 
um, it's a nest. It's a nested series of systems. This is the best way to think about things. Uh, it's the most useful way. It's the most practical way for businesses to think about things. Uh, and this contrasts quite strongly with the older uh, CSR type of model where there were three intersecting circles, a Venn, a Venn diagram, uh, where sustainability was in the overlap. This is a model, this nested model is a model that a natural scientist would rec recognize, a physicist, a chemist, a biologist, an ecologist would recognize this nested model as being truly representative of the way that the world actually is biophysically and, and socially. So we have the environment, that's the largest scale. Um, obviously, all life is dependent upon the, the environment. A healthy environment means that life has the possibility to flourish, to thrive. And uh, so this is the biggest uh, context for business. Uh, within the environment, we have human society. Human society is obviously created by the people uh, and uh, is there to uh, help us uh, live the best life that we can be. And a big part of that uh, enabling the possibility to live the best life is to ensure that we can meet our needs. And so human society has developed uh, the economy in order that individual members of society can better meet its needs. And of course, within the economy, uh, we have businesses. And each of those businesses has a business model, whether they recognize it or not, whether they've ever documented it or not, they have a business model, uh, and that's uh, within the economy. But the economy is part of society, and society is dependent upon the environment. So we always have to remember that this is not some divorced, abstract uh, idea, but it's actually embedded in a set of larger systems. So we say that a business model is a description of how an enterprise defines and achieves success over time. It's both the story and the numbers. And I've provided here the reference to the peer-reviewed article. Uh, the manuscript is freely downloadable uh, in that second link. Uh, so uh, if you don't have access to the scientific literature, you can get the manuscript there for free. So this is quite a shift in thinking uh, in terms of what the definition of a business model is, because historically, everybody's talked about business models being to do with how you uh, create and capture value and implicitly, the, the value that's been talked about is measured financially and usually uniquely financially. So this is a, quite a different definition of what a business model is. It's all about uh, how, it, how, to, how do we define success. Uh, and so that means that perhaps success is not only financial, but may also include other things like social things, environmental uh, elements that are important for success. And also it describes how you achieve all of those components of success over time. And it's also very explicitly recognizing that it's story, which obviously is the way we emotionally connect with each other. Uh, and it's also the numbers, uh, both the numbers financially, but also numbers environmentally and socially. For example, tons of carbon dioxide would be a good example of a number related to business models that uh, is a very important number now to, for us to think about. So this is a major rethink of value. And in fact, in the work that we've done, uh, as far as we know, we are the first um, group of people to publish uh, in the scientific press uh, any critique of any element of Osterwalder's original ontology or his uh, canvas. Uh, and I, I should say that, uh, I, you know, I, Alex Osterwalder is the giant upon whose shoulders we are standing. The piece of work that he did uh, in his PhD and subsequently with the Business Model Canvas is an amazing piece of work and we're indebted to him. Uh, I was chatting to him earlier on this year and, uh, you know, conveying just how grateful we've been for all the things that he has done. However, we think that we shouldn't sit on our laurels. Uh, we think we need to make progress. And so rethinking value is a key area. So one of the things that you've probably realized in Alex Osterwalder's model is that um, implicit in there is the idea that value is a gift that we deliver to customers and that we capture the value of that gift financially. So on the business model canvas, you'll see the icon for value proposition is a gift wrapped box. And when you go back to the original work that Alex did in his PhD, you see that he was reliant on a, a classic business model, a classic business uh, marketing uh, theory called product dominant logic. So in this idea, um, the business creates something, it understands the customer perfectly, and therefore when the business delivers the product or service for the customer, it's like receiving a gift, a perfect gift that's just right for them, and they're so happy, uh, the customer is so happy that they then pay financially uh, for the receipt of this gift. And this is, was a very popular theory in a business for many years. Um, 
But unfortunately, and this was a critique that was made uh, nearly 20 years ago in the marketing literature, so this is nothing to do with sustainability now, this is just regular business school marketing literature, that this approach to thinking about what value is works if you have perfect knowledge of your customers and if your customers all have the same worldview, the same values that you do as a business. And of course, we know that that isn't usually the case. You don't have perfect knowledge, customers have widely different. Uh, world views and so and, and indeed there are other stakeholders that we need to consider that we're creating value with and for so about as I said 20 years ago this new theory came up called service dominant logic and what service dominant logic said is that in fact value isn't just a gift it's actually something that co-occurs in all the interactions and all the relationships we have with all of the stakeholders of a business and it's it's co-created the value is co-created between the enterprise and all the stakeholders in many, many different ways. And that means that, yes, some of that value you can capture financially, but often the value is created because of a feeling that you create or an experience that you create uh, with your stakeholders. So a big part of the shift in the thinking between the business model canvas and the flourishing business canvas is the shift in the idea of value, expanding this idea of value and, and changing our understanding of the way that value gets created. So what do we need in order to be able to work well together in the 21st century? Business is a social activity. Therefore, we have to be able to work efficiently and effectively and gracefully together in order to reach our business goals. What do we need to work together in the 21st century? So a key thing that can help conversations, that can help people have better conversations is to have a shared language for describing and designing and telling stories about our businesses and our business models. And of course, this is what the business model canvas provided us. It provided us with this lovely language that we can use to have much better conversations, much more effective, much more useful conversations about our business models. But the problem is today in the 21st century, what we've recognized is that this language needs to include not only the financial elements, but it also needs to include the social environmental aspects as well. We need to have a common language relevant to business for all three of these types of topics that we need to integrate in order to be able to figure out all the different types of value that we can create and that we're going to create with our stakeholders. So our approach is to use what we refer to as a holistic enterprise design tool. And this is the Flourishing Business Canvas. And it's a tool that at its simplest level provides a common language that enables you to uh, in a useful visual framework, it enables you to collaboratively sketch, prototype, design, improve, understand, measure, diagnose, and perhaps most importantly, tell stories about any business model. And you can do that storytelling economically, socially, and environmentally. You can talk about how a business might be today with any uh, uh, shortfalls it might have economically, socially, and environmentally. Um, and it also uh, can work uh, to talk about the future and it can talk about the near-term future or indeed the long-term future because in the research we went back to look at what the science has to say about what we need to be doing what we need to think about the elements the ideas we need to think about in order to have a long-term sustainable future a, a future in which the possibility for flourishing uh, is there and uh, this as I mentioned was based on three years of graduate work uh, that I started uh, that's now been published in increasingly uh, well-reviewed, well-cited uh, uh, scientific research. And now we've had over five years of practice uh, with entrepreneurs and business leaders around the world using this new tool. And essentially, we significantly extended what Alex Ostervolder did in his research and practice, uh, obviously the very, the earlier and very successful uh, profit-first business model ontology and canvas. So here is the Flourishing Business Canvas. I'm gonna give you a very brief walkthrough to the elements of the Flourishing Business Canvas before sharing a case study with you to so give you a practical example so you can see uh, how it works. So it's a language for what we would call future fit enterprise design. We have, what we're saying is that this has the 16 necessary and sufficient questions to describe any business model, financially, socially, and environmentally, story and numbers, present or future. So this is what we're suggesting is possible with this tool. 
So just want to uh, share some elements of, of key upgrades uh, to enable us to do future fit business modeling. So obviously in the business model canvas, we had nine questions which were developed based on what the literature had to say uh, and practice had to say were the factors that historically we've understood are required to create and capture financial value. That's what the nine questions are focused on. But in today's world, unfortunately, the historic factors required to be financially viable uh, are changing. And increasingly, uh, our world is getting more complex and these factors uh, for financial uh, value are changing. So what we've done in the Flourishing Business Canvas is we've now got 16 integrated questions that ask about social, environmental, and financial value, including the original nine. So I want to stress here really very much that Osterwalder did a really good job of identifying the questions that are required for financial value. So the good news here is if you're used to the business model canvas, you already know an awful lot about how to do flourishing business modeling using the flourishing business canvas. So we've now got all the necessary factors to assess the often financially material risks and all the possible sources of innovation and opportunity that are relevant today and that science says are going to become increasingly relevant uh, in the future. So this is what this tool gives you a chance to do. Look much more expansively at all sources of risk and all sources of opportunity um, that uh, you need to consider in, in business today. So let's walk through this. So the first thing you'll notice is that these colored boxes are in the background to all of the 16 questions. So this is taking that nested set of systems that I showed you earlier, the economy that is created by society to help society's members meet, better meet their needs and that society is embedded in the environment. So there's a 3D element to this background. It's a nested set of systems. So when we put a sticky note onto this canvas in any of the boxes that are in the environment uh, contained within the environmental, uh, sorry, the economic system, um, so in the yellow box in the center here, let me just point with my mouse, so if we were to put a box in value co-creations, a sticky in value co-creations, for example, what we're saying here is that that must, to some degree, have a social and an environmental aspect to it as well, since the economy is part of society and is in the environment. Whereas, for example, a biophysical stock uh, is just something that has an environmental aspect. It doesn't have a social or economic aspect. And you'll notice here, uh, for costs, for example, uh, a cost may be economic, it could be social or it could just be environmental. So we could measure everything in monetary units, uh, Norwegian crowns. Uh, it could be in social units of, of happiness um, or it could be in or, or unhappiness in the case of a cost uh, or it could be tons of carbon dioxide. So we can we can choose the relevant measures that we want. So these are the three contexts for all business on the planet. The next thing is uh, one of the challenges is that the, in hindsight, business has um, unfortunately oversimplified um, its understanding. So a lot of the reasons why we have the unintended consequences of business today is that business people have oversimplified and they've oversimplified by ignoring these contexts. So unfortunately, the, uh, and that's led to some very dangerous outcomes as we've seen with climate change and income inequality and uh, many other social and environmental issues that we're facing today. So that means that the business model canvas is um, doesn't include all the necessary factors. So we have to add some factors. So for a tool designer like me, this is a bit of a problem because nine things is a perfect number, right? It's about how many things you can remember at one time between five and 10 is, uh, is about how many people uh, can remember at one time. But unfortunately, it's not enough. We, we now need some more factors. Uh, we have 16 now in the Flourishing Business Canvas. Um, so to, in order to uh, help the users of the canvas make sense of this, we've broken up those 16 questions into four perspectives. And for those of you who know the balanced scorecard, uh, this was another inspiration for Alex Osterwalder's work, and we've brought that forward as well. So we're still using the same four groupings. On the business model canvas, those groupings aren't shown. In the flourishing business canvas, we show them because it helps provide some focus, it helps guide people. So the four uh, are the people perspective, uh, which is the who of the business, who's involved, who's impacted, uh, who wants to be involved. Um, we have the value perspective, so this is what you do. Uh, we have the process perspective, which is how and where you do uh, everything in order to create the value with the people. And I stress the where here. Again, because we have the environmental context in the background here, uh, we can talk about place. 
And although um, Silicon Valley would like you to believe that everything is going to be virtual, last time I checked, I slept in a bed, which was in a place, and the food that I ate was grown in a field, which was in a place. So I don't think that everything's going to be virtual. I think there's going to be some very important things that will remain very physical and very place-based. Um, and so being able to talk both about the how and the where is very important. And last but not least, there's the bottom perspective, the outcomes perspective. So this actually talks about the why, the purpose of the business, the goals that the business sets, and whether or not its outcomes are the achievement of those goals. Again, in the business model canvas, it was assumed that the goal was being profitable, and that was it. There was no room to include any other goals. But our experience is that most entrepreneurs do have many other goals other than being financially viable. So the goals box and the being able to measure the achievement of the goals, not only financially, but socially and environmentally, is also uh, possible here. So these are the 16 questions. Um, and as I said, we're su suggesting that these are necessary and sufficient. And these are to create the possibility of flourishing. They're grouped by perspective and they're related to the contexts. And here's where the nine questions of the business model canvas appear. And what we've done really is extended those, each of the questions. So just to give you a couple of examples, in the business model canvas, we had customers, customer segments. Um, here in the flourishing business canvas, we have stakeholders, who is one of your most important stakeholders. It's your customer. So customer is still here. It's just we've extended it to think about a much larger group of people than simply your customers. Another example would be resources. Uh, in the business model canvas, of course, you think about the resources that you have to pay for, because that's what drives your financial costs, which determines your financial profitability. In the flourishing business canvas, you talk about all the resources that you use, whether you pay for them or not. So for example, if you uh, uh, drive a, a truck, drive a lorry, uh, you have an internal combustion engine. In order for that internal combustion engine to work, to be able to deliver your product to customers, uh, that requires you to burn uh, oil. Obviously the oil you pay for, uh, but the oxygen required to do the combustion you don't pay for, nor do you pay for the ability to dump uh, the pollutants back into the atmosphere, uh, at least not yet. So um, there's a resource that might be very important to some businesses uh, that you don't pay for the oxygen uh, that perhaps you should start thinking about as a resource that your business uses. So I just want to walk through uh, this and then we'll get into the case study. So you recognize these are the nine questions uh, from the uh, business model canvas. And I just want to show you how these, each of these are extended in the flourishing business canvas. So value propositions, which was product dominant logic, turns into value co-creations, service dominant logic. The next thing is we have to recognize that uh, in many cases, business isn't about creating value, it's about destroying value. If you're trying to put your competitor out of business, you are actively trying to destroy value for the stakeholders of that other business. Um, also, you can unintendedly uh, co-destroy co value for some stakeholders. Uh, you know, they may not agree with what you're doing or how you're doing it. And not to say that you should stop doing that, but at least you should be aware of it so you have a conscious choice about who you might uh, be harming in your business. Next, as we mentioned, customers change to stakeholders. Customer relationships, therefore, is now stakeholder relationships. Customer channels is now actually all channels. And you'll notice this is a bi-directional set of arrows now. So because you're co-creating, you need to think about also the channel back from your stakeholders into the business, not just the channel out from the business to the uh, customers. Of course, all of that uh, result drives not now uh, financial revenue streams, but benefits of all kinds, including financial benefits. On the other side, uh, suppliers and partners, uh, we now think about stakeholder partnerships. You could have partnerships for many different reasons, uh, not just simply to enable you to secure uh, resources and activities that you have to pay for. Um, the next thing is a brand new box. Uh, this is governance. One of the things that was not discussed at all in the business model canvas is questions of power, which obviously comes from things like your legal entity choice, a cooperative, for example, versus a for-profit legal entity uh, versus a not-for-profit. And, and there was really no discussion about which stakeholders uh, have the power to make which decisions about what aspects of your business model, your goals, etc. So we've included governance on the Flourishing Business Canvas so you can start to think about power relations between the stakeholders. The next box was the resources box, the acquired resources box. This is now all resources, whether you pay for them or not. And next you have the actions box from the Business Model Canvas. This is now all activities, again, whether these are activities you have to pay for or activities, uh, any other type of activities. And lastly, this now drives not just financial costs, but all costs. 
social, environmental, and economic. So let's now get into a, um, so what all this means is that it allows you to, it empowers you to co-create mutual benefit. So we have the idea we've got the world, the economy, society, environment. Um, you've got innovators who are in that world, they're leaders, they want to try and make a difference, they want to support realizing the sustainable development goals, for example. And so they want to start businesses that are choosing to do good in the world, to create impact in the world, um, in order that they can do well financially uh, for themselves and all their other stakeholders. And when they do that, of course, this comes back and changes the world in which they're operating by design. So we're taking, saying that the future is something you can design and we can help innovators do that. And by using a tool that includes all these factors, they can take a much more comprehensive and integrated view of innovation, of opportunity, as well as risk. So we're aiming here to help innovators accelerate this feedback loop between business and the world to drive benefits for themselves, their businesses, and the world. So I also just want to mention uh, a connection to enterprise purpose. Probably many of you are aware of Simon Sinek's work on the Golden Circle, uh, the idea that people buy why you do something, not just what, not what, what you do, but why you do it. And of course, the why, the how, and the what from the Golden Circle frames everything in your business model. But very specifically, the why frames your goals. And again, the adding goals to the Flourishing Business Canvas allows the entrepreneur or the leader to think about goals much more holistically than has been possible in the past. So let's get into the case study. Uh, this is a company called Tiffin Day. Uh, they're based in Toronto. Uh, and it's rare meals delivered is their um, tagline. So let me give you a few facts about this and then we'll switch to the canvas view. So uh, Tiffin Day uh, delivers hot lunches uh, to office workers in the downtown, the central business area in Toronto using reusable metal containers called Tiffins, that's them here. Um, and they then collect those Tiffins the next day. So these truly are reusable, not recyclable uh, containers. Uh, their customers are lunchtime eaters and it turns out that the people buying this food are young single men. Uh, it turns out that those are the people who don't like to cook. They want to be focused on their careers. They don't want to leave their desks at lunchtime. Uh, we can argue about whether or not that's a good thing or not, but that's the reality at this particular time. Uh, the recipes, the containers, and the service uh, are all modeled on typical South Asian practices, uh, specifically from Mumbai. There's actually been um, Harvard Business Review uh, case studies about uh, the uh, whole tiffin process in Mumbai. Uh, there's also a movie called um, The Lunchbox, if any of you like uh, a good date night movie, I'd recommend that movie to you. Uh, and uh, they use a website to place orders. At the time of the case, as we're describing it, uh, they'd been operating for four years and they were profitable at the time uh, that uh, we're describing. And they're located in Toronto, as I mentioned. So let's uh, switch over to the canvas. Let me make sure I get there. Right, here we go. Uh, Klaus, can you see that? Okay. Uh, I can only see the, the fact sheet, the basic facts. Okay, so why hasn't that? You should be able to see a canvas now. Um, let's see if I can just reshare, make sure that that's working. How about now? Should be able to see a canvas? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm using a tool called Murally, um, which is just an online uh, uh, whiteboard, basically. Um, it actually allows many people to interact at the same time, but you're just going to view this through Zoom today. Uh, so at the top of the canvas, uh, we put in the name of the company, we put who it was designed by. So I should note here that this is uh, the CEO's um, view of her business as of March uh, 2016. Um, so I haven't amended this. I haven't made it perfect. Uh, so you may start to wonder why certain things are the way they are. This was what she said uh, was her business model. So uh, let's uh, start by looking at the traditional financial view uh, of this uh, business. So obviously we have, um, now this is where I'm going to have to, oops, make sure that my mouse going to work. Oh, yes, there we go. Uh, so, often I have a second person helping me with this, but it's rather early in the morning in Canada, so I wasn't able to uh, 
get anybody woken up. So here we have the goal of the business uh, uh, sufficient uh, profitability. So where does uh, this come from? This profitability, well, it comes from the people who are buying, the customers. So this is uh, the lunchtime eaters, the uh, young uh, single men. So how do uh, the uh, customers um, buy the product? What's the channel? Well, we have uh, an electronic website and a phone that they can also use to place an order uh, for the food. Obviously, we've also got to get the food to the customers. So we have a, a channel of uh, physical delivery uh, in order to get the product. So what's the primary reason why uh, these uh, customers are buying from uh, Tiffin Day? What's the, uh, what's the primary value co-creation? Well, it turns out that it's the fact it's extremely convenient, both for the ordering and the fact that it's delivered right to your desk. Uh, this is the primary reason why uh, these customers are, are buying uh, from Tiffin Day every day. So uh, what resources are required to co-create this value with the uh, uh, customers? Uh, so the first thing is that uh, we have to have a kitchen uh, with a licensed chef in it in order to comply with uh, local health and safety, uh, food safety uh, rules. Uh, we need uh, intellectual property. We need the recipes so we know what we're cooking. In this case, it's a South Asian inspired uh, menu. And obviously we need the tiffins themselves, uh, those metal containers and some insulated bags to keep the tiffins hot uh, while the delivery is uh, being done. Uh, so what are the primary activities uh, that uh, this business undertakes? Uh, so obviously we, uh, oops, let me do this one first in the right order. We have an inbound supply chain, which is acquiring the ingredients. Uh, then of course we have a manufacturing process. So this is the food preparation, uh, cooking and the packing into the tiffins. And then we have the outbound supply chain, uh, which is the food delivery, the tiffin pickup and the cleaning of the tiffins once they've been collected. And uh, how, do we, uh, how do we measure success here? Well, against this goal of profitability, well, we obviously have to measure our revenue. Uh, so this is the food sales and we want to measure that in financial terms uh, and uh, we obviously need to do some accounting of how many meals we're selling so we can keep track of some basic uh, other statistics. And what's the primary cost of this business? Uh, well, it turns out the primary cost is actually the kitchen and the renting the kitchen and the, the chef. <coughs> Excuse me. So let me zoom out here so you can see this. So here we are. Here is the business model. Now you notice here, I've only touched the nine boxes that you would have seen. Well, with the exception of goals, I've touched the nine boxes that the business model canvas would have uh, talked about. Um, but, um, uh, and, and if we were using the business model canvas, we'd be done now. Th this would be apparently everything that's required in order for this business to be profitable. Um, but in fact, it turns out that there's a much bigger story going on here. And in fact, this is not the reason why this business is successful. It's part of why it's successful, but it's not the only thing that uh, creates success here. So let me give you a few more facts. Can you see the slides again, Klaus? Yes, I do. Perfect. So what is the why? What's the purpose of this business from the founder's perspective? So this is her philosophy that really drives that purpose. So she believes that the very act of revenue generation whether it be as a government earning taxes, a corporation earning revenues, or an individual earning a salary is pointless unless it improves lives, communities, and the environment. This is her perspective on the world. And this is what's grounding the entire business of Tiffin Day. So let me give you a few more facts about Tiffin Day that would help you see how this is influencing things. So the first thing is that it, this is vegan food, plant-based food, uh, and just as one example, uh, using some US uh, numbers, if everybody in the US ate, ate no meat or cheese just one day a week for a year, that would be the equivalent of stopping driving 91 billion miles or removing 7.6 million cars from the roads. So a pretty significant environmental potential benefit of moving to plant-based uh, food. Uh, the next thing is that the employees are new immigrant mothers available to work uh, while children are in school. Um, that's why it's a lunchtime business, uh, and this includes the founder, who herself is a single mother, and here's Seema uh, and her son. Uh, delivery is via an electric vehicle, uh, and there's quite a few reasons for that. I'll explain that in a, a little more in a moment. Um, the next thing is that she did not buy her kitchen. She did not find a place and have to have a large capital investment to set up a professional kitchen. She is using a shared resource that already existed in her community. Uh, in an existing vegan restaurant that didn't happen to open at lunchtime. So that was a good arrangement there. 
Uh, and then she maximizes purchases from local sustainable certified farms. So this is beyond organic, it's organic uh, with a focus on local and a focus on worker and animal welfare. And to demonstrate all of this to the world, uh, she's chosen to become a certified benefit corporation. Uh, actually, she had just done this at the time that the business model was done. So she scored the minimum that you have to score uh, to be a certified B Corp, which is 80 out of 200 uh, points in the B Impact Assessment. So how does that all look on the canvas? <clears throat> so Klaus, do you see the canvas again? Yes. Okay. Um, so the first thing we should talk about is, is what additional goals uh, does she have uh, because uh, she has um, uh, got this purpose. So the uh, first thing is um, that uh, she wants to have time to be a mother. This is not only for herself, uh, but also for her employees. And clearly giving people, giving parents uh, time to be parents uh, has a social benefit, um, but, uh, but it also uh, makes her employees more productive because they don't have to be worrying about all the complexities of fitting their work around their uh, family lives. Um, and clearly uh, this leads to a larger goal that she has, which is improving lives and communities uh, by building on her culture. So she's uh, South Asian uh, by descent and um, she wants to keep that culture alive in the Canadian context. Uh, so uh, she's, she cares about uh, that aspect of her heritage and, and uh, of, of, uh, of others as well in the, uh, in the community. And last but not least, um, she's uh, contributing to a healthy environment. She really cares about the environment and she wants the business to, to bring that uh, value, that purpose into its, into its goals as an organization. So, um, who are the larger groups of people then that this business is going to be impacting or that may be impacted by uh, this uh, business? So the first is, so we're gonna talk about actors now. So, um, and, and if you like, these are the larger groups from which your stakeholders come. That's probably the easiest way to explain actors. So we have uh, the recent immigrant community. Uh, so she herself is a member of that community um, and um, her employees are coming from that community for lots of different reasons that I'll get into. Uh, but where do the customers come from? Where do her customers come from? Well, they come from a larger group, which is eaters, which is of course everybody. And you can see how lunchtime eaters and young single men would be a subgroup of this. And um, as we get into the stakeholders now, um, her employees come from this recent immigrant community, they're new Canadian uh, citizens, uh, women largely, uh, with limited hours available to work. As I mentioned, they need to be able to drop their kids off at school and pick them up again at the end of the day. Uh, and so uh, having a lunchtime business means it becomes possible for them to get a job. And uh, these is obviously a group that often has a lot of tr challenges uh, getting employment because they don't have any uh, local Canadian experience or qualifications often. And so um, this is a business cooking the food from their culture. So they have an added advantage. And then SEMA is uh, helping them get uh, the food handling certification uh, as part of this uh, uh, process. Um, another key stakeholder also from the recent immigrant community is SEMA and her son. So this is another stakeholder that very often entrepreneurs uh, forget, which is the owners of the business. This business has to serve, their per serve these people as well, not just customers. If it's not uh, financially viable, if it's not uh, compatible with them, their values, uh, it's, it's not uh, good for them. So uh, we need to recognize this formally as a stakeholder. And last but not least, uh, this is a type of eater. Uh, obviously, you could think about these in many different ways, but it's the local farmers. Uh, obviously, they're very keen on this business because this business is a customer of theirs. Uh, and so there is a stakeholder relationship there with the suppliers uh, of the food to this business. So we talked about the value co-creations now for customers, but what about the reasons why all these other stakeholders uh, are involved in this business? Why would they, uh, why would the founder want this to be her business? Why would the local farmers want to supply it? Why would these uh, uh, recent immigrants want to work for this business? What value is being created uh, uh, there? Uh, so the first one is uh, for the founder and her son and also her employees is there's the co-creating the value of having time for family. So this is a key value co-creation. Uh, the next thing is there's many different aspects of this business that are building on the uh, culture of the employees and uh, the founder. Um, and uh, so this is, and, and obviously enriches uh, the wider community to have a diversity of food available. Uh, so the, the customers like this as well. So enriching uh, community. 
Uh, and then there's a, 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 some more detail behind the, the product itself. So it's not just convenient and easy to order and, and the fact it's delivered, it's also that it's delicious, it's balanced food, it's fresh plant-based food, it's boutique and high quality uh, meals, and it's based on family recipes. So many customers care about this value that's been co-created, but it's also important for the founder and for the employees uh, the, that uh, we're doing something of high quality that's worthwhile uh, and, and adding value. And obviously the farmers like it that the food's been used in a very uh, good way. Farmers also like the idea uh, that uh, seem as interested in buying products, uh, buying food that's been grown in an environmentally sustainable way that's local when possible, seasonal when possible, and organic always. Um, there are then uh, two partnerships that are required in order to co-create this value for all these stakeholders. Uh, the first one is to have a contract with uh, the kitchen uh, provider and uh, who also provides the chef. So we have a contract here. And we also need to get ensure we have reliability of supply of the, uh, of the plants that are being used in the food. Uh, so we have some supply agreements with uh, local sustainable uh, farmers. So uh, resources, I mentioned uh, delivery. So we have the electric delivery vehicle. Uh, turns out uh, the primary reason for this is operational. Uh, in Toronto, we have a quirk in our parking regulations that an electric vehicle, a small electric vehicle, this is a three wheel tricycle um, that has a heated cabinet on the back of it. Uh, this can park on the sidewalks right out, fr out front of the buildings where the deliveries are happening without getting a parking ticket. Uh, not sure if this is a, a, a little loophole that will be closed, but uh, an electric vehicle is allowed to do that. A regular vehicle is not. Um, but of course, it also has an environmental benefit uh, as based on the way the electricity is generated in Ontario. Um, the next thing is that uh, we need the resource of the uh, plants, uh, that um, the ingredients that are going to be uh, uh, purchased by this business. Uh, and um, so that's another resource. Now, SEMA recognizes that many of these resources, uh, all of these, uh, all the tangible resources are coming from the wider environment. They're part of the stocks of every atom, every element on our planet. Uh, and so she recognizes in her business model that, for example, uh, the tiffins uh, come from uh, iron and chromite that's dug out of the ground uh, to create the stainless steel. Uh, and that there's a footprint around that and that she's concerned about finding places where that is done ethically. Uh, and so she's recognizing that that is in her supply chain, although uh, quite distant from her, but she, she thinks it's important to recognize this. Uh, the other thing is she recognizes that she is dependent on the plants uh, and uh, those plants are coming from somewhere. Uh, so she wants to have that on her business model to kind of recognize uh, that uh, dependency. In terms of activities now, um, there's um, customer feedback and recipe development. Uh, so she wants, she's keen on continuous improvement. So she needs to get uh, information from her customers around this. Uh, so customer feedback and recipe development uh, uh, become uh, important. And then she's recognizing that these activities that she's performing um, are interdependent with the services, the solar powered services that uh, make possible all life on this planet. And so uh, very specifically, uh, she's dependent on water cycling. So this is the solar powered service where obviously the sun shines uh, onto the oceans, evaporates water, creates the wind that blows the clouds over the land, that falls as rain. That's where all of our fresh water comes from ultimately. And so she's very dependent on fresh water for the, to help the plants grow, uh, that uh, she turns into the food to wash those plants, uh, to uh, clean up the tiffins afterwards. So she's very dependent on fresh water. She wants to recognize that and be concerned about uh, doing what she can uh, to keep that uh, cycle going. Uh, and then she also wants to recognize that she's also dependent on photosynthesis and the soil in which the food grows. There's a lot of ecosystem services going on around uh, uh, that are, that upon which she's dependent. So getting towards the end now, how do we measure success of these other goals? We've already got the measurement of, of financial profitability. So on the benefit side of things, oops, I, you know, I forgot a sticky here. Uh, one of the things I did, and that should be blue, that should be yellow. Let me put that back to yellow. Um, so we didn't talk about the needs of the actors, uh, but these are human needs, right? So uh, complete needs of, of all people. Um, so humans need to care for their children. They need nutritious food and healthy environment. Uh, these are all things that are important to the actors and therefore uh, to the stakeholders. And I think I'm having an internet problem. Oh, no, there we go. Okay. Can you hear me okay still, Klaus? Sounds good. Okay, perfect. So in terms of measurements, just getting towards the end here. Um, the first thing is that uh, she measures uh, the number of hires she makes 
uh, of people with barriers to employment. As I mentioned, uh, new immigrants often have a hard time getting uh, employment. And so uh, uh, she wants to measure this, this social aspect of uh, having time to be a mother and, sorry, uh, and contributing to uh, improving lives and communities uh, by measuring actively and reporting on the number of hires of people with barriers of employment. Uh, the other thing she wants to measure is how do we know that uh, we are achieving this goal of having time to be a mother? So for both herself and her employees, uh, you know, sometimes people have to come in early and leave late, uh, but most of the time she's trying to make sure that uh, she's just working uh, in the window where uh, the kids are now at school. And so she wants to measure how many times do, does she and her employees manage to have breakfast and dinner at home uh, every day. So these are two social benefits. You'll notice where I put these in the cost box. Uh, these don't have an economic, direct economic perspective, although of course, uh, you know, making sure that uh, citizens who want to work can work uh, will have an economic benefit uh, to the society. For herself, it's really all about the social benefit. Uh, on the cost side of things, uh, she's very concerned about the environment. So uh, in her case, uh, she might measures her carbon and chemical footprint uh, in uh, system international units. So kilograms, uh, for example, would be uh, one of those units, kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, and then um, she obviously uh, needs to uh, pay for the ingredients, but she's also concerned about how much ingredient she uses, the actual weight of them. Uh, is that her fair share of those ingredients within, this, within her watershed locally? Uh, so she measures both the dollars and the, the kilograms. And uh, lastly, this is both a social and an environment, uh, economic benefit. Uh, she pays above minimum wage. Uh, this helps with retention of employees, but also she does it because she knows that it helps improve lives and communities uh, and uh, contributes to be able to uh, have time to be a mother. So you can start to see now, as we've added uh, uh, about 40 stickies here, um, that Tiffin Day's business model, the reasons why she's able to be profitable is a complex interlinking of many different factors involving many different stakeholders and value co-creations for those stakeholders, not simply the ones that traditionally we would think about prompted by the nine questions of the business model canvas. This business is able to be profitable financially because of all these interlinked factors. So back to the slides. Can you see the slides, Klaus? Soon, yeah. Okay, good. Here so here, here's the, the, uh, what you've just seen in uh, Mural. I've just put this into as a slide, um, and you'll get these slides as a PDF afterwards. Um, so takeaways to the case studies, and then I'll stop for questions. So the Flourishing Business Canvas allows us to efficiently create and tell stories that integrate the many aspects of a company's journey to create the possibility for flourishing, social, environmental, and financial. And it's based on the founder's values, what's her, her worldview. It helps us understand the choices that she's made and how all of those fit together. And as you saw, I told a story um, and it's a fairly complex thing, but I hope you've understood um, by the way I've told the story, how it all fits together or started to understand that. Um, and it allows us also to begin to explore how we might improve this business. So obviously now you know what the current business model is, we can start a conversation about how might we incrementally improve this business? What could we do to maybe add a new line of products, for example, or optimize uh, the costs further? Uh, but it also allows us to think about things transformationally. So we could think actually about a whole new business model, um, a whole new line of business, for example, uh, where perhaps we backcast the model against design principles for flourishing business. I'll talk a little bit more about that after we've taken your questions. So uh, I'd invite you to ask me some questions now. I'll uh, let me just get the chat up. If you would like to ask it via chat, please do so. If you prefer to speak out loud, just unmute yourself. I'm happy to do it that way as well. Klaus, do you have a question to start us off, perhaps? Uh, or I could uh, give the word to, to, to the guys from yeah, uh, sure. Yes in Order. Perhaps they can, um, they can fulfill with, uh, with their uh, uh, experiences with the, with the mythology and, and the canvas. Oh, okay, maybe I could start a little, it's uh, Egil. Uh, what we could see compared with the Ostervaldo canvas is that also the international standard talk about stakeholders or innovation in the center. Uh, and that's also taking into the new flourishing business canvas. So you will see it's a different between being focused on customer and now we're talking about stakeholders. And uh, also, 
value co-creation and what we haven't talked so much is value co-destruction but that's also linked to all of the stakeholders in a, a, a better form i would say because this is also in line with the iso 9001 thinking about uh, stakeholders instead of focusing on just customer as we did back in 2008 Mm -hmm. uh, it was more just a comment to that one and uh, of course we at Noda had to build a other business case that's more related to the oil and gas industry than a lunchbox uh, <laughs> supplier in Toronto uh, so it, it's been um, it takes some time to really understand and use the whole canvas and uh, especially uh, i think it was especially the new area environmental area and also the ecosystem uh, actors is some challenging to really understand and get a good grip of yeah hmm. uh, could you tell us just a uh, short about the uh, the reactions or the um, yeah how you how your customers has reacted to to using this canvas in their strategies processes yeah i think the reaction was very positive we have run through uh, is it seven companies now and we got very good feedback on it uh, but to be able to build a good business uh, case you need to uh, get them to think more uh, future basing or back casting so the challenge was a lot of the time to get them to think uh, or put the model uh, far into the future. They they all struggling with the day to day business, and I think five years thinking is more than enough. But we all managed to push them a little there, so we ended up on between ten and fifteen years uh, looking forward to see the trend. Uh, and that's quite important so you don't act or do something that's uh, not in line with your strategy or your golden why so so uh, that was the struggle but the, the canvas itself uh, and the experience was just to to get started and start using it uh, um, then they i think they catch it the point Want to add something on Helge? Yeah, I could maybe add also that uh, um, we saw in these uh, cohorts we run with those uh, companies that uh, uh, they typically uh, started with uh, maybe more the uh, Ostavalga part with the economical uh, values and uh, processes and people and goals. Um, so I think also it's good. Uh, uh, to uh, to challenge them uh, to really see uh, uh, to talk about their responsibility. What is your, for instance, uh, environmentally uh, footprint, and also to see uh, opportunities. Do other companies have uh, challenges uh, related to uh, environmental negative impact that you can be a part of to solve? Uh, so, um, uh, and I think these additional um, items in the canvas, not just talking about the the, uh, uh, the, the money, uh, they uh, they like it, but they need to be challenged at the same time. Uh, maybe especially also we have had a tough uh, some tough years in the oil and gas business, and a lot of our member companies are from the oil and gas. Uh, uh, so of course, when, when you have a company, when uh, more than you have to let go more than half of your all of your employees, uh, then uh, it's understandable that they uh, uh, instantly uh, think about the money and surviving. But even those companies uh, seems to be glad in the end to be challenged also with uh, society and uh, environmental issues and to add to that uh, because they i think that all companies we've met so far uh, when you uh, challenge them and uh, start talking about the simon sinek and golden circle they have very interesting whys 
people are not just wor uh, working and doing this for earning, earning money. They want to have a positive impact on their local community. Uh, they want to take environmental uh, responsibility and that kind of things. So, so uh, yeah. And all of the companies that, that has participated in these uh, two cohorts until now, they have uh, in a survey in the end um, uh, confirmed that uh, they would recommend this, uh, uh, this way of working to uh, peer companies. Thanks, uh, Egil and Jan Helga. Um, uh, Martin uh, asked a great question in the chat. Uh, so he said uh, he, he thinks that there are perhaps two kinds of logics when you work with customers in this canvas. Uh, the ones who have already built a well-functioning business model and the ones who are quite new to the business, old versus new companies. Uh, and then he's asking, do you see any different reactions, uh, objections or anything else uh, between, um, uh, between new and existing companies? Uh, it, it's a great question, uh, Martin. Um, so obviously, in the work with GC Noda so far, uh, we've been primarily, in fact, exclusively working with uh, well-established companies. In fact, I think it's one of uh, Norway's oldest companies is uh, 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 over 250 years old, or just approaching its 250th anniversary that we've been working with. Um, so um, what we're finding is that, uh, as Jan Helga uh, said, um, existing companies, of course, tend to start with what they know, which is their economic model. Um, and uh, then the canvas, because it's asking these additional questions, uh, we find that they then get curious. They say, well, why do you think uh, we should be thinking about ecosystem actors and the needs or biophysical stocks and ecosystem services? And then th they've opened themselves up to uh, exploring that, right? If, if you ask a question, you're open to the learning, possibly. And so the canvas prompts people to get interested and curious. Uh, and then slowly we start to unpack this. But we have to be recognizing where people are, uh, where people are at, what they're ready to talk about. Uh, so, uh, you know, we know what the science has to say, but we know we can't maybe take people super fast uh, to, uh, you know, perhaps directly what the science is already telling us uh, is important. Um, but we can at least start those conversations. So that's primarily what we've experienced with existing businesses. If I contrast that with entrepreneurs, we've done a lot of work with entrepreneurs. Uh, in fact, the reason I'm here in London is we're, uh, working with the Pan-European Climate Change Initiative, EIT Climate Kick, to uh, build a, a publicly available learning management system for sustainable business modeling for entrepreneurs. And obviously a lot of entrepreneurs are young people, um, and uh, young people are much, much more aware um, of both the social and environmental uh, problems that business has been creating, and very often their values, their life goals includes uh, creating a, a positive environmental and or social impact in the world. Uh, so with entrepreneurs, what we find is that um, there's relief, um, you know, oh my goodness, you're telling me I'm allowed to think about these things in a business context. Uh, and, um, you know, it, we, we were working with an entrepreneurship team to record these videos in the last few days here in London. And, and you know, they were saying, thank God, you know, we can now uh, include uh, in our business conversation these things that we as individuals uh, deeply care about uh, and uh, the, so there's relief uh, and happiness that uh, that they can have these conversations now. Any other questions? M Martin, uh, is that a good, uh, good uh, response? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I was just wondering because, you know, uh, I'm working with the uh, Innovation Cluster Program in Innovation ONGC. NGCA you know, is one of the one of the clusters and what we see is that, you know, we have Old companies are well established, they've been into business for many, many years, and then you have these new entrepreneurs and new and upcoming companies. So it's interesting to see how they react and how they kind of attack these, uh, these kinds of problems, uh, you know, in a different way, because that we, uh, the whole idea of, of, of working within ecosystems is actually that the, these companies actually co, uh, co, co act and co, co create together. So it's interesting to see if. Uh, if uh, they can kind of find some kind of, kind of uh, common language to, to, to work around and to find uh, to find uh, corporate cooperation and uh, new business models uh, between them, for instance. Excellent. I'm going to um, uh, want to share a couple of other things um, uh, to to, uh, to spark a little extra conversation about how this might all be useful to to all of you in Innovation Norway. Um, so, just as a reminder. 
uh, what we've, uh, what the Flourishing Business Canvas uh, enables, or what provides you is a common language for describing and designing flourishing enterprises fit for the very different futures that we, we know are coming. Um, and this is actually another thing that existing businesses are sometimes very interested in. They've recognized that all the uh, tools and techniques that they're taught in uh, business school, for example, traditionally, uh, are, are no longer uh, really helping them be fit for the future that's coming uh, because they generally don't include um, uh, the increasingly financially material factors that are arising from the environment and society. Um, it, the canvas builds an understanding of these interconnections between the enterprise with society, the environment and the economy. Um, it enables broader and deeper and richer conversations about all aspects of value co-creation and destruction. It provides context to enable collaboration. So that means teams can better align on key strategic decisions when they're starting an enterprise or when they're transforming an existing business, coming up with a new strategy. Um, but it also supports earlier practices. So we're not uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're saying business modeling, the ideas uh, of the financial aspects of business modeling were really great in the business model canvas. So let's build on those. Um, and it also builds on techniques that many of us are familiar with like lean startup and customer development uh, in the entrepreneurship world. Uh, you know, we're, we're not saying that those things are a bad idea, far from it. We think they're very good ideas uh, and we need to, uh, to build on them. Um, just want to mention, uh, there's been a lot of practice around all of this. So we have over 200, uh, just around 200 organizations uh, who are first explorers uh, of the uh, Flourishing Enterprise Innovation Toolkit. Uh, and uh, these are some of the leading ones uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, many of uh, these uh, folks are using the toolkit uh, in their funded uh, uh, projects. As you can see, there's a couple of Norwegians up there, uh, uh, Swedish uh, as well, uh, Flemish, uh, other in Europe. The Pan-European Climate Change is, uh, Climate Kick uh, is operating in all EU countries, uh, obviously some in Canada and, and elsewhere as well. So where are we trying to get to uh, with this uh, uh, toolkit? Uh, so ultimately the canvas, the Flourishing Business Canvas will be available under a Creative Commons license uh, as a key element of the Flourishing Enterprise Innovation Toolkit. Uh, the toolkit includes not only the tool, the canvas, uh, but it also includes methods, uh, design principles based on the science, you know, how do you create good answers to the questions, uh, and case studies such as the Tip in Day One uh, and others. Um, the canvas will be free to use commercially and non-commercially. Um, however, at the moment, it's still in development. Uh, we want to make sure we get this right uh, nobody's ever tried to do this before. We need to be humble, but we need a lot to do a lot of learning. Uh, so part of working with uh, you, got, you guys at this stage, uh, like with the other first explorers, is for you to give us feedback so that we can make this as good as it needs to be, uh, so that we can really uh, uh, put aside these earlier uh, tools um, that uh, don't include all the things that are important in today's world. Um, so um, uh, the plan is to produce a book, uh, a how-to book uh, that will publish commercially that will introduce the canvas and the other elements of the toolkit. Um, this is a global team working on this um, and uh, some aspect we're planning to, to crowdfund in order to create the, the biggest possible groundswell uh, to really launch the book at, at scale and to uh, have this become the, the default uh, approach for developing a business going forward. Also just want to mention uh, the methods aspects of the toolkit in a little bit more detail just to give you a sense of this. <coughs> So as you heard us say, and as Agil said, our generic recommendation is that the best use of this tool uh, comes when you use it in uh, a planning technique called backcasting or future basing, as Agil said. Uh, there's a method called the ABCD method, um, which also includes relevant uh, system science-based uh, scientifically credentialed design principles for business. Um, and this was work that was uh, originated in Sweden uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, the framework for strategic sustainable development. I put uh, one of the latest papers about that. So we've got 30 years uh, of experience around how you do uh, this sort of design work in general. And what we've done is contextualize this using the canvas. Uh, so we have for established businesses, uh, the Flourishing Enterprise Strategy Design Method. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be able to uh, share that this book has just been published called Rethinking Strategic Management. Uh, this is literally out in the last uh, two weeks and uh, the Flourishing Enterprise Strategy Design Method. Um, I, I'm just holding up the book to the camera if uh, you're looking at the camera. Um, the, uh, this book um, includes a chapter on the Flourishing Enterprise Strategy Design Method. Um, and um, uh, we're expecting to uh, uh, get quite a lot of coverage because the introductory chapter in this book is by uh, Henry Mintzberg, who is uh, one of the leading 
uh, strategic thinkers worldwide uh, today. Uh, we've already written a detailed how-to for this method, and we're going to be sharing that with all the first explorers shortly. Um, we've also built a whole education program around this. This is the work that we've been doing uh, with GC Noda and one of the first explorers that I've helped to start Better My Business. Uh, and uh, we're expecting to be doing further work on this business evolution uh, program uh, with Noda and also Climate Kick uh, and others. Uh, we're just waiting for some funding in the Canadian uh, context right now that we hope will uh, enable us to uh, continue this work and, and continue discussions with Climate Kick. Uh, on the startup side of things, um, uh, some other colleagues and I have been working on a major upgrade to Lean Startup. Uh, to take it from again just being focused on the financial aspects of the business uh, to focusing on the financial social and environmental aspects uh, this method is called the lean for flourishing startups method um, this is uh, going to be published in a peer review paper it's already been accepted we're just making final revisions right now that will be in the journal of cleaner production i'm expecting that to be out uh, probably early next year uh, if you'd like access uh, i've already shared a, an early draft with uh, klaus and pat klaus is a new version that we've just submitted uh, re with revisions uh, that I can share with you as well. And uh, we, uh, we've also developed a whole accelerator program, another education program, um, with the, the first, another first explorer that I helped to start, Lean for Flourishing Startups. Um, and uh, that uh, program has now been uh, experienced in various ways uh, uh, by uh, probably about three or 400 entrepreneurs uh, worldwide. And that's uh, what we're working with Climate Kick on, uh, for example. So just to give you some sense of uh, the methods. So um, with all that said, we've got about uh, five, six minutes left. Uh, so I'm curious, um, now you've had an introduction to it, um, how could all of this be useful in, in your work in Innovation Norway? Right, so anyone? Uh, see from Tromsø here. Uh, I think it's really going to help be helpful to um, to get the sustainability um, thinking uh, into the business models of the of the companies. And it's always nice to have have tools and visual tools at least to to explain and to help them um, move forward in the in the sustainability uh, thinking. So I think it's, uh, it's looks really nice, and I. Uh, looking forward to work uh, closer with uh, with you and and this model. This is Anne Marie from Sarpsborg. I like the tool, uh, but uh, I think it's not for everyone to be good on. Uh, so I think it's have to be some specialized uh, who is using it. But I have a question. How does the tool interact with the UN Global Goals? Are you using it in the yes in the system or not? Um, so um, uh, I'll answer that question. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I'll answer that in in two different uh, ways. Um, the first is that uh, the original research that we did. Um, went to the best available science that's out there today um, across a range of different disciplines, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, ecology, uh, as well as obviously business uh, and psychology as well. Um, and uh, of course, that's the same scientific knowledge that was that's been used to help determine what the global goals should be. Uh, and so uh, at, at that level, uh, there's complete compatibility. We know that the 16 questions on the Flourishing Business Canvas uh, are the 16 questions you need to be responding to if you want your business to contribute towards uh, Norway's Norway realizing its commitment to the SDGs, uh, the, the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, that, that it's made. Um, in terms of um, you know a specific business uh, that uh, has said, okay, we want to focus on uh, you know one or two of the 17 goals to start with, and then working through the details of how that particular business will contribute to the achievement of those particular goals. I would say uh, at this point, uh, we've not had the opportunity to do that work um, in any detail with a company, um, but um, uh, we're looking forward to that opportunity. Uh, so if you know of a company that has already made that commitment 
and is serious about developing strategy uh, or a startup that's serious about developing its first business model uh, to particularly focus on uh, one or more of the, of the goals, then uh, that would be a great place for us to uh, see how it could work and see uh, if there are any specific challenges or uh, practices that we can develop to, to make that process uh, easy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. And also a question about measuring uh, the uh, yes the goals you are uh, in environmental. Uh, have you any systems uh, you are looking to, or you just find the the best units to measure it in? So um, uh, the, the work that I mentioned that was done in Sweden 30 years ago, um, the Framework for Strategic Sustainable Development, uh, recently um, a foundation uh, started in Canada and now with the UK, uh, based in the UK, uh, called the Future Fit Foundation, has developed a, a whole measurement benchmark um, based on that science. And so um, that's uh, the measurement system that we would recommend people use. Uh, in the workshop uh, that we'll hold in Oslo in uh, just over a week's time, uh, we'll introduce the Future Fit Business Benchmark uh, because it's not only the measurement system, it's also the design principles uh, for you know, what are good answers to the 16 questions. Uh, so that would be my, my initial answer. Um, there are many other measurement frameworks that can be useful in particular industries. Uh, you know, many industries are developing uh, their own measurement frameworks um, that are specific to their industries. Uh, but if you want a science-based one, uh, then uh, the Future Fit Business Benchmark is the one that uh, we recommend. I know some companies who are using it. Uh, I have earlier been presented for it and I think it's quite easy. It's uh, not so complete, complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I, I'm, uh, I, I know the guys at the Future Fit uh, uh, Foundation very well. Um, I was actually part of that project in the, in the early days uh, of it. So yeah, I, I think it's a great, great system. Thank you. There's uh, Aril from uh, Trendlag. Uh, in your example, you introduced new boxes and governance and code destruction of value was not uh, exemplified. Could you just give a quick example how that mm. would environment and society as well as economy for the, for instance, the Tiffin box or others? Yep, for sure. So um, uh, you, you're well spotted that there were no uh, stickies from uh, Seema Pabari for Tiffin Day on her canvas for those two questions. Um, and as I said, she just didn't put anything up there and I didn't uh, you know, want to force her to put something up there that she hadn't thought about. Um, so in terms of governance, um, so uh, an example of governance, uh, which is very typical, uh, would be that um, uh, the entrepreneur, the founders uh, get to make all decisions on all topics, but they proactively seek opinions from their employees and other stakeholders. That would be a typical sticky that you might put there. Um, if you are a for-profit business that is privately uh, constructed. Uh, on the other hand, a cooperative, uh, the governance uh, stickies would be all about uh, what rights the members of the cooperative have to make decisions about what aspects of the business uh, what decisions have been delegated to the management team by the members of the cooperative, uh, that type of thing. Uh, for value co-destructions, um, in the case of SEMA, one that uh, I've often discussed with people is, uh, this is uh, a boutique food, it's quite expensive, and so um, that means not everybody can afford it. Uh, so for eaters, if you remember that actor, uh, who want to eat nutritious food uh, that's environmentally friendly, uh, they actually may not be able to afford it. So for them, it's actually harming their ability to meet their needs at the moment. Um, so that might be um, too expensive, might be a value co-destruction uh, that you want to put up there. Again, to recognize that you're co-destroying that value or maybe co-destroying that value so that you can um, acknowledge it, uh, perhaps do something about it over time, uh, work to try and figure out how to get the cost down or produce another version of your product that uh, is lower priced. Um, so that would be an example of a, a value co-destruction. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, um, so I'm sorry to say, but the time is out. So so we uh, so we need to to wrap up um, the session. Um, and I would, uh, of course, I would say uh, many many thanks to, to Anthony for uh, for your introduction to this. It has been quite good. Uh, yeah, really, really. Um, 
so we can't have any more questions now, but we should um, just end by uh, just short uh, describing the, the next workshop, right? That we're going to have in Oslo. Uh, so the, the correct date is 28th and 29th. That's Thank Monday you. and Tuesday, right? Sorry, my mistake. No problem, no problem. Um, and we we'll start at lunchtime and, um, and we work and continues to the day after uh, until lunchtime. Um, and for those of you that would like to participate, please uh, give a heads up to, to Tuben or myself. So, uh, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to meeting as many of you as possible in Oslo in just over a, a week's time. Uh, and um, uh, Agil and uh, I think Jan Helga will be uh, joining us uh, to, uh, to help uh, facilitate that uh, workshop uh, from GC Noda. Um, and part of the reason for that is I wanted to uh, thank you all for allowing me to do this presentation in English rather than Norwegian. Uh, your English is rather better than my Norwegian. Uh, and, um, but with Igil and um, Jan Helga in the room, uh, you'll be able to have conversations in Norwegian if you're more comfortable doing that. And they'll be able to help you as they're familiar with the canvas and uh, first explorers themselves uh, of, of the canvas. Uh, one question, Klaus, where is it to be hold, hold this uh, uh, two days meeting? It's going to be in our headquarters in Oslo, which is Arkasgata 13. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. So uh, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, thank you everybody again and I'll stop the recording now. Klaus, any other final words? Just uh, again, thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you.